um, for staff. Um, we have made some tweaks and I'll let Ashlyn talk about that. But just again, appreciate all of you. We will work with you as we can on any questions or concerns, but um, it is attached. It's attached to all of this federal money that they're sending us. And I will stop there and let the next person go, Becky. Good afternoon, you guys. So like Tanya mentioned, we have updated our pandemic requirements. You guys will remember that those are posted to our website. So if there's somebody on the licensing team that can pop that in the chat box, that would be really good. So the significant changes though that I wanted to talk with you all about today are there's no longer is a group size. So remember in the past, our pandemic requirements um, required us to have 10 or less in a group. So that has been removed. And then masks do not have to be worn outside. So I want to go back and visit with you about group size for just a second. We still know that separation to the extent possible is a great thing to do. And so when you're talking about your groups, if we can keep the children in their same assigned groups as much as possible, then we know that that will help reduce the potential exposure. And so let me just kind of give you an example. Let's say that you have a group of children in classroom A and they've always gone to classroom A and you have a group of children in classroom B and they've always gone to B. What we're hoping is that you will still continue that, that you will keep like children assigned to classroom A still in classroom A and that we won't see um, a mixture of the children from classroom B to classroom A. So I have talked to a few providers about, well, the children are aging out of one classroom and up into the next one. That is still okay. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying like, let's keep the children together in their group as much as we possibly can. And then for the mask, like Tanya said, we still have to wear masks uh, inside our building. We still have to, the staff still have to. But when you go outside, you're no longer required to wear a mask while outside. So if you're outside on the playground for recess, um, some people have been taking picnic lunches outside just to get some fresh air with their kiddos. That is okay to do. Um, we've had a couple of, of uh, people ask us about parents and access into facilities. So I wanted to talk about that for just a moment. Um, parents have always had the ability to come into the facility, um, according to us, according to uh, DHS and the pandemic requirements, and that has not changed. Um, we do know that there are some providers who are limiting everyone into the facility, um, and you can still do that as a provider. You can um, make that decision yourself, but please know that if we are called um, and we are asked by parents or whomever, we are going to say parents do have access into the facility um, and that it is not a pandemic requirement to prohibit them. And then the other thing, I'm seeing a couple of, let me see if I can speak a little bit louder and I'm also gonna turn up my phone. Um, okay, if you have or are approached by colleges that are uh, needing the student interns or observers to come in as part of their coursework, their college coursework, they absolutely can do that. They will just need to follow the same screening process uh, that you all have for everyone else. So there, that has been added as well to the pandemic requirements. Um, we have also added a link there because we know that you all might want to see the CDC guidance for your own self. So when you look at the pandemic requirements on the website, you will see the link at the top. Um, so you can click on that and, and look to see uh, any of the requirements. I wanna make a note to you all that it's 20 pages long. There's a lot. So the requirements that you're being held to are just two page document that you will see uh, posted to the website. All right, Tanya, that is it for me. And those are the pandemic requirements. Ashlyn, there's a question. If you could take that last uh, item in the chat box about, I think it has, um, if I'm reading it right, Allison, I'm thinking you're talking about the parents entering the building. 
Um, even though the pandemic requirements say that drop off or pick up, up should be outside. So that may be a change, Ashlyn, if you can address that. Um, we're still asking to the extent possible that you do the drop off outside if you can. But I think what you're talking about there, Allison, is parents coming into the facility. And so they can come into the facility. I think the name of the game, you all, is for you to, to just know that the pandemic is not over yet. Um, we have seen the reduction in positives across our state, which is a wonderful thing to, to see. But we still need to make sure that we are uh, keeping up the wearing of masks, washing of hands, separation, limiting a whole lot of people in and about the building. So it, it is in the requirements that you try to do the screening and processing outside um, of your facility. Um, let me see, Tanya, I can go ahead and take some of these other ones if you wanna give me just two seconds here. I'm gonna scroll up to the top. Oh yes, somebody put in from our team that we are monitoring the mask requirement and we absolutely will update you guys as we can. Um, it, you, for transportation and wearing masks, it's still the children, if they can wear the mask, if they're over the age of two, and it looks like here is a pre-K student wearing a mask, if you can get them to wear a mask, that is going to be the best thing to do, um, especially when you're running at uh, full capacity, which you are allowed to do now. You can have full capacity and transportation on, on your van. Okay. That's right, it is a, it's a recommendation, but not required. Um, on the playground, Shelly, uh, to the extent possible is yes, to try to keep your classes separated if you can. Um, again, the name of the game is if we can keep them separated with six feet of distance, that's gonna help with the potential um, exposure that they might have. Remember. Children, this has come up a, a few times, you guys, children still are not in the queue for immunizations yet. So they can still you know, potentially get COVID and pass COVID. And so we just need to make sure that we're protecting them to the best of our ability. I think I've talked about the screening question. Um, yes, we still need to take temperatures. Um, and yes, even for parents, children, staff coming into your building. Um, yes, we still need to be asking the COVID questions during the screening. We still need to sign the children in and out. There no longer is a group size of 10. We're just asking that you keep the children in the same groups to the extent that you can. Um, Hey, Ashlyn, I'll take the last one. Um, I have a request in for from our federal partners for programs that do not, let me just be clear, programs that do not take any of the funding from our division that's attached to the Child Care Block Grant. That's not just essential workers. That is maintenance, supplemental, deep cleaning. There's a lot of different parts to it. So, um, but we do have a handful of programs that do not take federal funding. We have been adding programs steadily to do it, but I have a request in from our federal partners. If a program at the point that they stop taking those, are these requirements still in place? For background checks, it's all licensed programs, regardless of whether or not they take our funding. So I just wanna put that out there. I have not gotten a response yet, but I will. we will keep you guys updated for those of you who, are, who may not be taking the funds. But remember that affects all funding. It's, it's everything that's attached to the block grant. So for better beginnings, annual grants, that all comes from the child care block grant. The maintenance payments that we're sending you quarterly comes from that block grant. So I just wanna make sure folks know that and are aware of you know, the funding that you will lose, but we respectfully understand what you're asking and I have asked our federal partners. I think for those of you asking about the temperatures, we, we're gonna take that, let me, I've seen a couple. We will look at that and look at the CDC guidelines on that. I think it just says screening. We might be able to make some adjustments there. We, we thought we had this done, but let me, because several of you are asking, I feel like we, we owe that to you to try to look and just see, is there anything else we can do in the area of screening? 
If it doesn't say temperatures, maybe we can make an adjustment um, or maybe we can make adjustments to the recording and logging of that. But please know we will take that into consideration and post new ones. Um, so the question on this one is, so if you do not take any funding, I have asked our federal partners. I do not have an answer today. They have not responded to me, but I have asked the question, if we have programs that do not take any federal funding from the child care block grant, will they have to adhere to the pandemic requirements? That question is in. So I'm waiting for an answer. Once we get it, for those of you who have that question, we will be, we'll post it to our website, but we certainly will follow up with the call. But if it happens between this call and the next two week call, we will post it on the website so that you'll have a place to look for it. Um, and your ratio never changed, but the group size is changing. So that's removed, but ratios never were adjusted if you guys weren't aware of that. It's just your group size. So um, yes, we, we will not have a link. It's just gonna be on the Division of Child Care's website. So until I have the answer, I won't have a place to even post it, but it will be on our website. If you will go to the Division of Child Care under pandemic, is where we will post that for those of you asking the question about if you don't take funding. So we will try to get you an answer as soon as possible, but I have asked that question. So I'm gonna shift here. Ashlyn, do we have other updates before we give it to our colleague? No, ma'am, that's it for me. And we, like you said, we will look into all of these questions and we'll update the website. So you guys just pay attention to our website. Yes, and yes, the group size is removed. It is not there anymore. So I am so excited to introduce my friend who is so committed to lead testing in Arkansas. He has a grant and he received it right at the beginning or shortly before COVID. And I know it's been a great deal of work, but Tim Kane has been an awesome partner with us from the Department of Ed. And we've asked him to be on our call today to visit with us. You all may continue to ask questions, but please know, um, please pay attention to Tim's information. Lead poisoning is very dangerous for young children and very damaging. And we wanna make sure that children are not being exposed. So um, just really excited to have Tim on and I'm gonna hand it over to him. All right, thank you, Tanya. And it's been a pleasure working with you and Ashlyn and everybody on your team on this project. Uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, you know, we understand uh, that's been the priority, and we totally get that. What And as you said, Ashton said, we're not out of that pandemic yet, but hopefully we're climbing out of it. And so what we wanted to do, Tanya and Ashton were kind enough to have us on your call. And uh, I, I would be remiss if I did not introduce my partner in crime, Teresa Lee. Teresa, are you, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I can. And I, I got to say, Teresa has done a bulk of the work. I haven't I haven't done that much. Uh, she's she's done a bulk of it. Teresa's with the health department. What I'm going to do, y'all, is go ahead and put a link in the chat for y'all. If y'all don't mind opening, it's a link to the lead testing opportunity on our website at the Arkansas Department of Education. If you'll open that up. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is an opportunity to have your water, drinking water tested for lead for free. We have a grant from the EPA that covers the cost of the test. And I am going to turn it over to Teresa now. Okay. Um, like Tim said, we got a grant uh, to provide lead testing for all daycare centers and elementary schools in Arkansas that want to volunteer to test their uh, plumbing for lead. And uh, we have on that website that Tim showed, we have an application. And so far we've had 67 daycare centers to participate. And once you uh, fill out the application, we'll send you um, some instructions and the instructions are very simple. All you have to do is, uh, is uh, tell us where you're going to uh, sample and that would be like water fountains or sinks where you serve children food or drink. And then we'll uh, have bottles shipped to you and you um, just collect water first thing in the morning, put, the, put it back in the box and it's 
prepaid shipping back to the lab. They'll test it and you'll get the results. And lead uh, in Arkansas is really not a problem. Uh, we have very few water systems that have a problem with lead and the lead is not in the drinking water. It's when the water flows through your indoor plumbing that it can leach lead if there's lead in the uh, plumbing fixtures or in the pipes like lead solder. And um, anyway, uh, we encourage you to uh, to volunteer to test. It, it's just simple and then you can be, you know, assured that you're giving safe water to your children. Thanks, Teresa. And you, you said we had 67 child care centers apply. Yeah, How we've many? had 67 apply, but after I sent out in, uh, the, a little instruction sheet with a form for them to tell me where they want to sample so that we can send the correct number of bottles, I've only had about four of those 67 to actually follow through. So if any of you are on the call, we'd like for you to uh, send back that information um, so we can get the bottles to you. And Teresa, do you mind putting your email on there so they can, or the email that they need to send that information to you sure. in the chat? Hey, Tim, can I ask you a question real quick? Because I think sure. I'm giving out appropriate information. It is even our licensed uh, child care family homes could participate in this, correct? Not just licensed centers? Uh, I didn't hear you, Ashwin, sorry. Okay, I let me try one more time. Uh, not correct information that the lead testing is also allowed in our child care family homes, not just our centers, is that correct? Oh, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, Teresa. And again, I want to thank her. She's done a great job. We've enjoyed working with you, Tanya, and Ashlyn and your team. We'll continue to do that. I just want to encourage everybody to think about that. I know you still have a lot on your plate with everything going on with the pandemic, but this is completely free and, and won't cost you a thing to do the testing. Thanks, Tim. We, we right. will continue to help push that message out. Um, I do think it's important for any of you who are not aware, you know, just read some information about um, lead poisoning in children. It, it's really important and they're really willing to help us. So we were real excited to partner with them. So I appreciate those of you who have expressed interest. And for those of you who maybe with pandemic, we did talk about how, what a challenging time it's been and that it's really easy to put something over to the side. But, you know, now that we are kind of hopefully in a different place, this might be something that you'd be interested in. So um, please reach out to Teresa and Tim and um, just look forward to our continued work in this area. Thank you. I, Thanks for having I am us. monitoring the chat box gang for questions. Um, I think most of them have been answered. And um, I think we've answered all of them. If, if there are other questions, please feel free to type those in. Um, we have put up information about essential workers, um, the new applications that we've received since April 2nd, but I do want you to be aware, we, we are serving currently, um, as of today, 7,371 families on essential workers. That's in addition to our regular low-income childcare. So it's really impacting a lot of families without regard to income, and that's really, really exciting. Um, I will say that childcare is coming in as number two behind healthcare. So we have a lot of teachers, well, childcare and education. We have a lot of teachers. So I think Ivory is going to be um, sharing some information. So Ivory, if I've stolen any of your thunder, I apologize. I'm gonna pass the baton to you. Uh, I thought you were just gonna finish it for me. <laughs> As, as Tanya mentioned, uh, mentioned just earlier, um, we, we do have 1,602 new applications that we received as of April the 2nd. Uh, since May of 2020, a total of 7,314 applications have been approved. Okay. No. What about now? Hello? 
Yeah, I can hear you, Aubrey. You're just a little muffled. <clears throat> no one can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thanks. So uh, as, Tanya, as Tanya mentioned, uh, we have 1,602 new applications that we received as of April the 2nd. You know, our staff are working diligently, you know, to ensure that those applications are being processed in a very timely manner. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's prioritized. We have a group of individuals that are actually keying those around the clock. Uh, since May of 2020, a total of 7,314 applications have been approved. And those numbers are uh, steadily coming in. And we have someone, we have an individual here in the central office that keeps us with those numbers every day and provides us with a uh, report on where we are with those numbers on a daily basis. Uh, we also um, deep cleaning. Uh, 10,814 uh, has been paid, you know, so uh, those are steady coming in. And also the supplemental payments, uh, March payments will begin within the next two weeks. So um, we're working, uh, waiting for that new money to drop in. Uh, also the uh, maintenance payments, you know, uh, that's going to be done on a quarterly basis. And uh, the next payment would be uh, May of 2021. Um, also, um, I don't know, a lot of people may be interested in the ABC summer program, but the participating program list has been finalized and training and accepting letters will be delivered soon. So we're in the process, we're moving that forward. Um, so that's where we are with the ABC summer and that's my report. Thanks, Aubrey. We had a couple of questions. If someone could type in the chat box the deep cleaning uh, link, the reimbursement for deep cleaning. Um, yes, if you um, if you are currently not a voucher program, uh, we will take your information. If we can get a little information from you to know which program and see if we can help with that and assist with that. Yeah, and we're for, fully caught up with those. So yeah, if you have anything, just send it to us. And then there's a question about if you're school based, Jennifer, thanks for that question. There is no rush if you are a school based program and you're wanting to serve essential worker families, we are going to have adequate funding. So if you're, you know, I would say whatever your normal application time is, August, July, August will be fine. Um, I think getting them in probably in July and August would be good for a start date if your school starts in August, but there's no reason to do them now because they're not going to start until then anyway. So um, no rush on that. We will have funding. There is the funding that we currently have, which as I mentioned to you all, we still have 109 million of that funding. And then we have a new wave of funding that we don't have the official notice on yet. So this essential worker piece is going to be in place for up through 2024, possibly, is the time frame. So no, no worries about programs that may be closed for the summer and then reopening. I would just do your normal process, try to get them in a little bit earlier than school starts, and we should be fine uh, with, the, with the staff who are keying those. And I'm just trying to monitor the box. Um, and if any of you have comments, please feel free, staff, to type in the responses, but I will just keep monitoring. Oh, that's a good question, Jennifer. For programs that do end, um, we can work with the staff. If you will notify the staff that your school is closing, we can put those in suspension and then reauthorize those in the fall. There, there's a way for the staff to do that, I think. so. We can work with those programs that might be ending. Um, there's going to be adequate funding, but they're not going to have to reapply. There's we we want to be efficient with that. So, if they go off, um, is the essential worker payment from DHS included in the childcare billing payment? No, that is handled separately. You do your childcare billing, and then we process a payment for you for the essential workers. Please correct me, staff, if I have that wrong, but. That's my understanding. Um, I, there's a comment, Ivory, that folks could not hear. I think Ivory's updates, if you could put those back up just so we can run through those. Hi, it is Patricia, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so the essential worker 
vouchers in the same is the same as you're billing your child care voucher so they will be connected in the same payment thank you for correcting me it is in your payment it's the maintenance payments and your deep cleaning that are separate and the supplemental payments that are above and beyond your normal rate so apologize for that confusion but you're you're getting key those authorizations for essential are getting keyed and you bill the same way um, Ivory's information is up. He basically was giving an update on the number of applications that we've received since April 2nd. Um, remember, we had families that were already being served and we just rekeyed those families that still wanted um, essential worker vouchers. And then we started taking new applications. So he has an update there. Um, the deep cleaning total is $10,814. And then he was announcing that they will be doing supplemental payments um, within the next two weeks for March. So we're starting to process those supplemental, that's your additional rates for infants, toddlers, preschool and school age. And then I, Chris, uh, Christina, I had put the COVID numbers um, for children and, and staff earlier. Um, Becky, if you can put that slide back up that has the numbers of positive cases Cumulatively, I wish I could remember two seconds ago, but I do not remember that number um, as it has changed and I've monitored it throughout this whole event. So I'm, I've lost track. So 1,119 children and 1,637 staff. That is from last March, gang. That is a cumulative total. And the PowerPoint will be on the website. We, we are putting that on the website. Um, but I, I want you guys to just stop and think about that for a moment. You know, that's roughly 3,000, it's a little less than 3,000 um, individuals, children and staff, 3,000 out of a possible 163,000 plus all the staff, that's just the children. That's the capacity. That's not even all, it, it's probably two to 300,000. So it's like, it's like 10%, it's like such a small amount of it. It's a really, really 1%, I think to be honest, it's a really, really small amount. Um, so it has been, and it's because we already, someone asked a question about cleaning and sanitation. The cleaning and sanitation hasn't really changed. You all already have in licensing requirements that you have to clean and sanitize areas. And for those of you in better beginnings, that's part of the environmental writing scale. So there's a lot of that, as I've explained to legislators and folks, that happens already in our field. We are we were primed for this kind of event because we know that we work with little kids that, as I tell people, eat boogers and touch the floor and put it in their mouth. Like they do things that <laughs> spread germs. So because we know that, we have to put things in the licensing regs to protect them. And so we had a lot in place. So there shouldn't be anything extra that you're having to do around cleaning and sanitation if you're doing the normal licensing stuff, there shouldn't be anything extra, you should be fine. Now, if you do have a case and you wanna be reimbursed, the staff have put that in the box um, and you can get reimbursed for deep cleaning, but shouldn't be the, should be the same. Um, so let me, I'm just gonna monitor again, the chat box, make sure we have everything. Yes, the supplemental rates are only, that is funding that is one time through the pandemic funding. We will not have that funding once that funding is uh, exhausted. So we will be, um, and, and I, we do have funding in that category right now. I can tell you, um, I can probably, I will get a projection for the next meeting based on the projections that we've had so far so that I can tell you for budgeting purposes and I apologize for not having that today, but um, I appreciate that question, Karen Craig. That's a really good question, but we will be able to tell you, we will still have essential workers. So if you're taking essential workers, you'll still have that funding as reimbursement, but those supplemental rates, once that funding is gone, it will be exhausted and there, there isn't any more funding for that. So it's a really good question, but I will have a projection on the next call um, to let you all know, when we expect that to run out based on the, the amount that we're spending each month. So it's a really great question. And then the parent screening, we are, Darla, we're working, we're going to take that into review. 
So we had updated the pandemic requirements and we're just gonna take a look at that one again and make sure that there isn't any adjustment that needs to be made. So if we can make an adjustment, we it does have screening. The Centers for Disease Control still has screening in their guidelines, but I want us to look a little more deeply into what that entails. Are they real specific? Does it have to be temperatures? We're still doing temperatures here in our agency and those screening questions, but that doesn't necessarily mean CDC has that as their guidance. So let, let me just check that and we'll get that updated if there's going to be a change. It's a good question. Um, the question about better beginnings, I will let, if there's anybody from A-State that wants to take that question, they probably can answer that better than I can. We certainly are in conversations with them, but I expect as we continue to go back to normal, whatever that normal is going to be, um, that we will start doing some of that work, but I will let the A-State staff who are on the call um, respond to that. Or Dawn. Don Jeffrey on our team, who can get an answer? I'm not sure if we have that answer. This is Don. As of to, as of last week, we weren't. We, they still are not positive when they'll be able to start going out and doing reviews. If there's someone from A State on here, they may have a better answer. But as of last week, there still wasn't a definite answer when and what month they would be able to start back. I think. Um, I have a question that's a really good one. And I think the answer for prior to um, some of the new funding would have been no about money available to replace or repair if lead is detected. Um, I know Tim and them in their program, their, their grant did not have funding for that. If I recall, Tim, please correct me. But I do believe with the COVID funding that we have not received official notice of, we certainly could address that with that funding for existing programs. If there's an existing program that was, the, the language in the federal law is qualified, which means they had to be licensed and regulated prior to the date of this grant. And if they were in place and Tim's team detects it, then I think we could certainly entertain that as a way to improve their program. And it feels like a really good use of those funds. So um, that's a great question. And so I would just make that commitment um, which might help some of you be, be a little more inclined to get that lead testing um, done if you were afraid that something might get detected. Um, there's a possibility that it won't, but it would be great to know. And I, I think that that is an awesome question. So I just want you all to know that's exactly the, the way we can use those funds to help improve a program and really make it safe for children. Um, Okay, Ashlyn's responded to April, thank you. Okay, I think that's it. Did anybody respond to Ed, who is asking a question about who to contact for um, accepting essential? Okay, Patricia Johnson has. So Patricia Johnson, Ed is the person to contact um, and she will work with you, she and or Dawn, because you do have to be um, a quality program that is in our child care development block grant in our agreement with the federal government. Um, and we have to report out on quality annually. So that is a requirement. Anything else? I would love to give you guys back 21 minutes of your day. Because <laughs> I know you are all jam packed just as we are. Um, I don't have any um, clarification on curbside drop-off or pickup. Andrea, let me see if I can take this one. We are going to take a look at the screening specifically in the pandemic requirements. So there might be some adjustments, but we've had a lot of questions about parents coming into the facility. And I just wanna say our pandemic requirements actually had language that said parents could in fact come in. You just wanna make sure that you're screening people that are coming in your facility. You just wanna make sure that you know that they don't have the virus and they're going to spread it to your staff and the, or the other children in the building. So that is not a change. We have never not allowed parents in. I do think programs might, and I've talked to a few programs that have ha had that as their policy. Um, that's a program decision, certainly. Um, so, you know, you all can do things beyond what I can do. It's your program. You own it. 
you may be able to do things or if you're in a school, your board may make decisions, but we don't have a requirement that parents can't get go in. It's on our list of people who can, in fact, go into the facility. What we've had in place is screening requirements and we and really encouraging drop off and pick up outside so that you didn't have that uh, potential virus spread going in. But parents, you could, I know a lot of programs have scheduled for parent engagement activities or just so a parent could come in and see where their children were going. Because I gotta tell you, as a grandmother and as a mom, um, I would want to know where my children were and what they were doing. And so, you know, you can do some staggering or you can schedule. So we just, I just wanna clarify, we don't want the message to be that we have something in place that doesn't allow parents in, but we are going to clarify or look at the, specific area of screening and make some adjustments possibly. Um, if you want to do curbside drop off and pick up, I talked to one program last week and she said, I have 80% of my parents probably will never want to go back to coming in because they're not late for work anymore. So, uh, you know, there's probably will be some new normals and changes as a result, but parents can go in. You just want to make sure that you screen them and you can do them at the front. If you don't want them all in the, you know, coming in and out of the building and going into classrooms, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, but I know the the outside pickup, I think, was the easiest for a lot of programs. But that, you know, we will do some clarification there. So I appreciate you for pressing on that one. We are going to do a little bit of updating and try to make sure that we're really following what is required. We're trying to roll back things that we don't have to do anymore. So the CDC guidelines that Ashlyn has included the link to on our website is from March 12th. Those are the most updated guidelines. And we, it's 20 pages. And we didn't wanna throw 20 pages at you because we already have guidelines around sanitation and cleaning. And we wanted to try to keep it consistent with what we've been doing. So we're just taking what we've been doing, which was based on CDC guidelines and our licensing regs and trying to adjust those so that you all are not overwhelmed with a whole new list of things that you may have to do. So, and the feds are okay with that. They, they're okay with us using what we've been doing, but we will be adjusting and we will continue to adjust those. Please know that we will let you know on this call but you can check the website daily to see if we've made any uh, changes because we are changing things whenever we get notices or when we realize that something from CDC has changed. It's hard to project, Jennifer, what will happen this fall because of where we'll be with pandemic. I, you know, I don't know. I believe, as I understand it now, it's running concurrent with the federal. You know, the feds have the pandemic still in place as an emergency. Even though states are starting to lift that back a little bit, the federal government still has a, a pandemic emergency in place. Um, hence the reason they're passing all these funds to us, guys. <laughs> so I don't know if they're going to lift any of these things, but um, we certainly, I mean, it's really, it's certainly up to our state, our legislature, our governor as to whether or not we wanna take their funding. We don't have to take all this money. We could say no but I don't really think that's a good idea for our field. So I'm okay with, let's try to figure out how we can make this work with as simple pandemic requirements as we can. Um, and I know it's not ideal gang, but I, we, we've taken $160 million so far and the new money appears to be an incredible amount more, maybe half a billion is, is projected for Arkansas. So I think we want to follow their guidelines if we want to use their money. Um, so I just I just want to try to kind of simplify it that way. But we will update you and we are monitoring. And so there may be adjustments that can be made. The biggest thing about the mask is that children and Ashlyn talked about this is they're not slated to be immunized. So that's, you know, even if you're staff, I thought maybe as we had staff vaccinated that maybe we could look at that. But children still can pass it, can get infected and still pass it to folks. So it's just something to consider. And so, and because we have to follow these for federal reasons, you know, the, the CDC guidelines still have the mask and screening on them. But we're going to take a look at the screening specifically, and we will update you guys. Um, question from Morgan, is the essential child care payments taxable? Do we need to... Uh, I am not the financial expert, but I suspect if, if voucher funding, it's all coming from the same pot of funding. So any funding that you get, 
in my opinion, is potentially going to fall in that bucket. But I would consult with it if you have a tax uh, an organization that does your audit, or you could call a CPA firm in your community and ask. Certainly, we can have you talk to someone in our, our audit department that reviews audits for the agency, but I am not a financial expert, but I do believe that any funding that you get would be counted. So any experts on the call, any of my staff, please feel free to chime in if you know the answer to that. And thank you, Teresa. I know the mask is a hard one. Um, you know, we still are wearing them here in the agency. We all look forward to a time when we can see everybody's beautiful smiles and uh, what's behind the mask, but so far we're still wearing them for safety um, and appreciate you all. Um, I appreciate you all. I wasn't able to give you 21 minutes, but maybe 14 minutes. So. Kelton's name is in the chat box. Kelton is an audit contact. Thanks, Paige, for putting it in. I know a few of you have reached out. I know he does work different hours. So please know if you reach out to him and he doesn't respond immediately, he will. It, and we're in tax season kind of right now, although we have a little bit of delay time frame, but he does get busy with reviewing audits. So, uh, but please feel free to reach out. He can answer that question about the funding. And I think that's a great question. So we will see you all again in two weeks. Thank you. We'll continue the calls and um, we'll have any updates. I will work on getting you guys a projected amount for the supplemental for the next call. So staff, make sure I stay on point with that and don't let me forget it. Um, and then I see a note from Sunshine that they have not gotten their refund from the I and A reimbursement. So we'll check into that duly noted and reach out to you, Sunshine, to make sure we have everything. Appreciate all of you. Stay safe um, and enjoy this lovely weather. Get those kids outside.